start here. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So the live stream has started. So, uh, so I'm going to mute everybody and then Bobby and, and Faye can go. Just remember to unmute yourselves. Bobby, you can take it away. Okay, so um, the next speaker is Faye Yan from Rutgers um, and in a sort of continuation of Greg's uh, introduction, introductory talk, um, she's going to be telling us about line defects, the UVIR map and exact WKB. All right, um, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, also, thank, thank you very much for the invitation for this workshop. Uh, it's my pleasure to speak here. Um, and also many, many thanks to Greg who gave an incredibly nice talk earlier on such a short notice. So my task here is to give sort of like an overview um, for the relations between class S theories and Hitchin systems focusing on roles played by land defects. Uh, it is a very vast subject and uh, I'm still not sure like uh, what contents and for each given content to what degree of details is suitable uh, for, for this setup. So it might be that what I describe here uh, is not, not really what you would like to know, or it could also be like you want to know more details on any given uh, things I talk about in, in my slides. So if that's the case, I encourage you to interrupt my talk at any given time and then just ask questions or comment on, um, or just tell me like what you would know more about. And I will try to, um, you know, um, try to understand your question and then try to um, talk more about uh, the subject you would like to hear. And also I am not a mathematician. So for most people here in the audience, you might feel like uh, my talk is sort of like floating in the air. Um, if that's the case, I also encourage you to interrupt my talk and then ask me to clarify things and I will try my best to, to, to accom accommodate your, your requests. Uh, okay, so I, I will talk about land effects UVIR map and near the end of my talk, I will talk a little bit about connections to exact WKB. Um, so uh, Andy Nitsky had uh, planned to talk more about the Riemann Hilbert problems and the conformal limit. And uh, I, I will say a little bit about the, the subject near the end of my talk, but unfortunately I won't have time to, for, you know, the glory details of the subject. Sorry, I got stuck. Okay, so, so the outlook um, is to describe some of the correspondence between class S series and Hitchin systems and in particular, uh, what are the corresponding part for land defects in class S series? And I guess I should also put like question marks here about the arrow. Um, so my talk will mostly based on review of work by uh, Gail Tomoronetsky, as well as some uh, recent developments. So the physical world where uh, all these connections happen are certain four dimensional theories with eight supercharges um, called Enkuth 2 theories of class S. As Greg has revealed uh, a lot in the detail in his talk, these theories are four D Enkuth 2 theories originating from a partially twisted compactification of a 6D 2,0 theory uh, labeled by uh, simply less Lie algebra G, where G is ADE, on a Raymond surface C with appropriate decorations in terms of punctures or twist lines. And you get the 4D theory in the zero area limit of the Raymond surface C. So throughout today's talk, I will only talk about punctures and mostly regular punctures, which I will explain what it means in a minute. Uh, I will uh, not talk about the cases for the twist lines. So uh, as, um, as a common feature for supersymmetric field series, um, such series, this class S series has a continuous family of uh, what physicists call vacua, where you have a subspace of vacua, which is closely related to Hitchin systems, as I will explain in the next slides. 
And this is uh, um, in physics language called the Coulomb branch, where at a given point on the Coulomb branch, the low energy effective theory is just some um, equals to abelian gauge theory. And on uh, at the level of Riemann surface, the Coulomb branch is parameterized by mirror morphic uh, decay differentials uh, on the Riemann surface with prescribed um, boundary conditions of pole orders at the location of punctures. So here I have specified the divisors here. Oops, sorry. Uh, the divisors here and ZI is, are the locations of the punctures and the PDKI are the pole orders or the highest pole orders for decay differentials at such a puncture. So for, for, for type, if, if we take the Lie algebra to be type A and only consider punctures at E without twist lines, then this will be an equality here. However, if you're considering uh, type D and type E cases, or even for type A, you could, some, you could sometimes introduce the twist lines. In that case, the Coulomb branch will be more complicated because uh, you will encounter various constraints uh, re relating the coefficients of different decay differentials. So it will be a much more complicated space. And um, the, a systematic study of uh, the Coulomb branches and classification of class S series have been um, done by, by this physicist. So a point in the Coulomb branch uh, will correspond to a branch covering C tilde over C, where the C tilde, which sitting inside the cotangent bundle C, is what physicists call the zebra written curve. So what does this have anything to do with Hitchin systems? Uh, so the physical setup to relate uh, what I said earlier to Hitchin systems is to further compactify this 4D theory on a circle uh, with radius I denoted here as capitalized R. Then at low energy, the effective theory is a 3D n equals 4 sigma model with a target space. So what is this target space? Um, physical, what physicists um, do to understand this target space is to go back to 60, and then you change the order of compactification on the Riemann surface across the circle. This is done by Gautam Marneski. And the reason why you could uh, change the order is because uh, I didn't go into detail, but Greg uh, mentioned in his talk that you have some partial topological twist on C. And as a result, the resulting 40 equals to theory will not depend on the conformal scale of metric on C. So in that case, what you could do is instead first compactify on this circle with 3DSR to get a 5DN equals 2 super young males. And then you put the 5DN equals 2 super young males on C. And uh, as also as Greg already mentioned, if you study the configurations of BPS, sorry, if you study BPS configurations, which are Poincare invariant, sorry, super Poincare invariant in the 3D uh, space time, what you will get are certain equations on Riemann surface C, which uh, turns out to be the Hitchens equation, which I, I wrote here. And um, one a slight difference from uh, what you um, encounter in mathematics is you, you see the compactive equation radius R does enter here. And in this equation, uh, so by A, I meant uh, it correspond to a G connection in a topological trivial G bundle V over the Riemann surface C. And uh, G is some compact group whose lead group, sorry, whose lead algebra is this mass rank G. And there are a lot of subtleties um, which go into to uh, like concretely what what are the global form of this uh, this compact group G. And I will dodge all those subtleties here. And for throughout today's talk, I will either talk about the lead algebra being GLN or SLN where the compact group will be UN or SUN. So, and sorry, so, uh, so let me extend the notation of the, 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 uh, the Hitching equation a little more. So we have the gauge field A, and then FA is just the field strength. And then phi here is a so-called Higgs field, which will end with valued 1,0 form. And as we said earlier, the Riemann surface C is decorated with punctures. Uh, the effect of these punctures are to specify corresponding boundary conditions for the connection and for the Higgs field. And uh, one distinguish between the so-called regular puncture where A and phi will have a simple pole at the location of the puncture 
or a irregular puncture where phi will have higher order poles at the location of the puncture. So um, that's, that's like the, the general correspondence between class S series and Hitchin systems. Um, are there any questions at this point? Yeah, so the dependence on R, uh, can you uh, kind of comment on it? You will then take, to get 3D theory, you take R goes to infinity or, or what? You, you get an honest 3D theory to, uh, by taking R goes to zero. However, the mm -hmm. story, I believe the story of GMN is uh, not for R goes to zero, but rather for large radius R. Um, yeah, that's why I'm asking you. Yes, yes. But... yes. Um, other questions? Okay, so so now I'm going to, oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I, um, I have one more slide on HH system, sorry. Um, okay, so so as, as is well known, the, 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 the Hitchin modulus space or modulus space of solutions to Hitchin's equations is hyperkiller. So it has a CP1 words of complex structures. Um, I denote that J zeta, where zeta is valued in CP1. And different JZ expose different features for the HMO address space. And this is based, um, has been worked out starting from Hitchin and uh, later on by Simpson for the case of parabolic Higgs bundles uh, with regular punctures. And by uh, these two people worked out the case with irregular punctures and also in the context, physical context by GMN. So if we take Z uh, to be a C star parameter, then the Hitchens equation will imply the flatness of a complex connection uh, where, where the corresponding gauge field I denote as my scale A. And it's given by this particular combination of the, the, uh, the gauge field for the compact H group and the Higgs field phi and its Hermitian conjugate phi bar. So in the, um, in the J zeta uh, complex structure, the modular space of solutions to Hitchens equations is different morphic to a modular space of flat GC connections on C, where the GC connection is given by this. Something special happens if zeta is equal to zero or infinity, which is complex conjugate to the zeta equals to zero case, so I will not describe. Um, in this complex structure, the mod modular space of solutions to Hitchens equations differ morphic to modular space of Higgs bundles. And it is a complex integrable system. So it's fibered over the so-called Hitchin base, which physically is identified with the Coulomb branch of the class S series, where the generic fibers are compact tori. In the physics language, you could uh, sort of think of the, the fiber as parameterizing choices of electric and magnetic Wilson lines along the compact vacation circle. And moreover, uh, the separate curve, say tilde, we mentioned earlier, is identified with the so-called spectral curve in the Hitchin system language, which is simply given by the characteristics of the Higgs field phi, where lambda here is identified with the cyber vector differential. Okay, so now I'm going to specialize on the uh, physics side to land effects. As Greg has described in lots of details, the class S series of the mixed families of land defects are de are denoted as L zeta, labeled by a C star parameter zeta. It's, going, uh, so, so it's supported along time direction and at a point on the three dimensional space. Where this zeta being a C star parameter parameterizes the preserved supercharges. Such land defects has, uh, have been studied by many different people in different contexts. Sorry. Um, so what's the geometric object on the Hitchin system side that you would look like if you want to study those land effects? And as Greg described earlier, such land effects descend from certain surface defect in the 62, 2,0 series, which, uh, which extend along time direction and which also uh, wraps certain paths on the Riemann surface. And it's carrying some representation of the Lie algebra. So as a result, the land effects here will also um, depends on certain paths on C and carrying some representation of the Lie algebra. In the simplest case, if you take the Lie algebra to be A1 and the Riemann surface only has regular punctures, what, you, um, what the land effects depend on 
where the path will be a non-self-intersecting closed curve on the Riemann surface. The situation is slightly more complicated if C contains the so-called irregular punctures where the Higgs field has higher order poles. In this case, the path P will correspond to the so-called integral laminations, which, uh, which were studied in the mass literature by Falk Donshorf and also in the physics uh, context by GMN. And those are the collection, the collection of paths uh, either closed or open with ends on marked points correspond to the Stokes directions at irregular punctures. So treatment with irregular punctures here is you dig out, you, you take out a small disc around the irregular puncture and then the boundary of the disc is of course a circle and the Stokes directions at the irregular puncture will intersect uh, the circle which mark you corresponding points and those integral laminations uh, could consist of open paths where it, uh, which ends on those, one of those marked points. Um, so this is for the simple case of the type A and uh, in general, this, uh, the, sorry, the, 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 the other being uh, A1. In general, this path P could also contain so-called junctions where uh, different paths carrying different representations meet uh, where at the junction point, you're associated with certain G-invariant tensor where the effect of this thing is to pick up a singlet in the tensor product of the corresponding representations of the paths meeting at this point. And uh, this junction is also studied both in the mass literature and the physics literature by many, many people. So uh, what's the relation with Hitchin systems here? Uh, again, we, we, um, we need to do the circle compatibilization and uh, what you will do is you will wrap this uh, line operator uh, around the compatibilization circle. And then the web of such a line operator wrapping the circle turns out to be J zeta holomorphic functions on the modular space of flat connections, um, which uh, is uh, different morphic to the modular space of uh, the solutions to Hitchens equations. If you look at the complex structure J zeta. Um, so, uh, in in general, um, in general uh, cases, do you take the complex structure uh, as in the character variety. Since you say that it's holomorphic, I forgot what is J zeta. Do you take if you consider it as a character variety? Is it the complex structure in which it is holomorphic? Yeah. Uh, or you consider it as 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 a bundle with. Uh, I, I, I'm yeah. treating it as a character variety, if I understand correctly. Okay, 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 thank you. Um, yeah, thanks. So, so um, in the simplest case, you, you could explicitly write down such uh, holomorphic functions, um, where let's again take the Lie algebra to be A1, and C only has regular punctures, so in, which means by a land effects, I just mean some, 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 some close non-self-intersecting curve on the Riemann surface C, which denoted as P here. And then by analyzing the physics of the 6D surface defect, you could derive, or I should say not, uh, not completely derive, but uh, reasoning plus some conjecture that this, the web of such a land defect could be written as trace of the holonomy of this corresponding flat GC connection, which appeared earlier when we discussed the modular space of uh, so when we discuss the HMO address space in complex structure J zeta. Um, so this is exactly the flat GC connections there. And, um, and the trace will be taken according to whatever representation you associated to this uh, closed curve P here. And the dependence on P will be only through its homotopy class. And so this is the simplest case in general though, uh, what you do is you compute parallel transport of this flat GC connection along the collection of the paths. And then if they meet at some junction, you contract together those parallel transport where this G invariant tensor that's associated at the junction. So um, that's what um, the general picture for uh, what you would expect to, um, for the land effects in class S series in the Hitchin system side. Are there any questions at this point? Sorry, just a, a stupid question. Why is P allowed to go into the irregular singularities, but not into the regular ones? 
Yeah, so so I have a stupid answer to that. So um, so so one way you get those uh, irregular punctures is you 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 take some 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 collision limits of regular punctures. And you could imagine you could so suppose you started with like two regular punctures which are very close to each other, and then you have some paths like uh, goes right in between the two regular punctures, and then after the collision limit. Um, you know, intuitively, it could happen that this path will end at the irregular punctures, but it cannot. Um, there, there, there are rules um, that's worked out by GMN and also I think the mathematical counterpart of Falk Gunchurf that turns out that well, um, certain rules will require you um, that the end point of the path on the, the little circle bounding the disk that you dig out uh, around the irregular puncture well, and the ending point has something to do with dog's directions, but um, but intuitively, uh, what happens is uh, in the collision limit. Some so suppose you had the path going between regular punctures. Now it looks like it will end by some at some marked points around irregular punctures. Uh, it's not a good answer, but uh, that's like an intuitive answer I have. Uh, does that work? Thanks. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Uh, okay, so so uh, so so okay, so so we we mentioned earlier that there is this big deal of Coulomb branch or class S series. Um, so the the reason why we mentioned it is because in general, if you want to study land defects in some 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 UV series, the class S series, a lot of the series are like non-Lagrangian, which is like um hard to you know it's hard to imagine what you're dealing with. However, uh, the benefit of Coulomb branch is uh, if you go out to a point on the Coulomb branch, what you get is just the effective theory, just some abelian 14 equals 2 theory. So, where the land effects are simpler to describe here. So, then from the physicist's point of view, a useful way to study those land effects in class S series is deforming to a point on the Coulomb branch. And then you follow the def uh, defect into the infrared. Now, I just want to make a quick a small comment or um, either physicists or mathematicians here, you might uh, wonder whether you lose information by deforming to a point on the Coulomb branch. Uh, however, the, the, there are some special feature associated with the land effects that this sort of deforming to a Coulomb branch is sort of like in, um, invertible, which is um, usually not happens in phys physics. However, um, there is a way to keep track of um, like, like the labels of UV land effects in the infrared, namely, there is no screening here. Uh, every two different UV land effects will be able to be distinguished in the infrared according to the corresponding label. Um, th there are some subtleties about like where that applies. It applies between, like in the overlap between class S series and the, I believe, um, 14 equals 2 series or quiver tap, but I'm not sure about the, the, the actual overlap, but that's just a comment. Uh, okay, so so what do you get in the infrared? In the infrared, um, the, the, the the original UV land effect you start with, after you flow to the Coulomb branch, it will become a superposition of supersymmetric land effects in the abelian theory with some integer coefficients in the superposition. And those integer coefficients are in physics language called the uh, frame BPS index, which is uh, in mathematical language, it's like the, the frame version or um, sorry, um, the frame version of the ordinary BPS index or the DT invariant in the context of land effects. And so th this quantity was first um, def defined by GMN, but it has been studied and uh, different methods to compute such a thing has been developed in various different contexts. And I, I fear that I, I'm not uh, pu putting a complete uh, reference here. Uh, so uh, what there are some special Sorry, yeah. Oh, there's a question. No, I mean, uh, no. It's a question about your your your, your formula. Uh, oh. Because, um, yeah. Yeah. So, but you have not spoken about it. So yeah, I haven't it. talked about it. Maybe no, maybe no. after I uh, say a couple of words. Yeah, about yeah. It. yeah. Sorry. Okay. So so uh, before that, uh, maybe maybe let me just uh, mention quickly. The, the, you see this uh, this uh, I just call it omega. Uh, this this omega. This frame BPS index dependence here, it depends on the land effects and it depends on um, 
uh, gamma here, which in the physics language are the infrared electromagnetic and the flavor charge. And there is also a geometric interpretation in the, in the corresponding spectral curve part, which I will describe in the next slide. And it also depends on a point U in the Coulomb branch or on the Hitchin base. So as you vary parameters, in particular, if you look at the space of the Coulomb branch across the zeta plane, there will be certain co-dimension one walls in that space where the, these, these, these integers could jump. And physically, this jumping could be understood as uh, the, the so-called like the, the frame BPS index will count the so-called frame, frame BPS states in the physics language. And thus at those co-dimension one walls, the, fr the frame BPS state could decay into the unframed of vanilla BPS states. And that's a physical reason for the jumping. And um, sorry, um, mathematically, this is also related to the jumping of the DT invariant. So now uh, I, I'm going to uh, say this something about this formula. So so after we we th this as a, as we said earlier, this integer coefficients, sorry, this frame BPS index are integer coefficients in this superposition. Namely, we have a UVIR map where on the left hand side you have the uh, UV land effects L which are with the zeta labeling the pre -super preserved supercharges. And then this arrow here means you're de uh, deforming to a point on the Coulomb branch. And then on the right-hand side, you'll see this, um, this, this expansion in terms of this quantity x gamma zeta here, which uh, I use a symbol to represent the infrared Wilson duft lines with charge gamma. Physically, you could think of it as a word line of some infinite massive dials with charge gamma. Um, okay, so so what was the question earlier? Sorry. No, uh, the question was that um, uh, your uh, line defects, uh, as you defined, the holomorphic globally defined holomorphic functions. Yes. This let's call it character variety, whatever MBT mathematically. Okay. On the uh, are your right in your right hand side, you have this x gamma of z, yeah. which. Uh, mm, I mean, they should have some infrared meaning. Yes, yes, the, I will describe in, in two slides. Sorry, um, the ah, next okay. slide. So, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's sorry, sorry, rather uh, a question whether YQR uh, parameterize an infrared by sort of Darbu charts on this. Uh, sorry, this. good charts? I mean, X gamma, uh, it's not globally defined. It's yeah, it's not. They defined only in some chart. Like yes. sort of Darbu coordinates, yeah. Yes. But does it physically mean that your vacua in infrared, they kind of correspond on the, the, to the choice of this covering? Yes, yes. Oh, so, okay. Yes, yes, okay. That, that's, that's, that's a great point. So um, the, the Coulomb branch, you could uh, imagine the Coulomb branch is glued together of those different charts where uh, the gluing is, uh, in the physics, hunt type will be the electromagnetic duality map. But uh, that what you mentioned is a great point. Namely, um, on the left hand side, you say this land effects, which is perfect defined in the UV. And as you vary parameters, you shouldn't expect, say, phase transitions here because it, it doesn't happen here in the in close two series. But on the right hand side, as you said, this uh, this index will jump, and then correspondingly, you would expect the vibe of this infrared land effects will also jump. And indeed, so the, the vibe of those infrared land effects cannot be global functions. And they, they are indeed double coordinates on corresponding charts. And I will uh, mention a little bit like in the next, next slide. Yeah, thanks. Uh, okay, so, so before that, um, I, I, I told you earlier, like the geometric correspondence for the UV land effects, they correspond, they, they correspond to some paths on the Riemann surface. What would the infrared land effects correspond to? And we recall that a point on the Coulomb branch correspond to a branch covering, say, tilde over C, which is a spectral curve or physics language, several written curve. But I draw a really naive picture around what it looks like locally. And uh, throughout my talk today, uh, I will only assume simple branch points, namely the different sheets will, uh, at most two sheets will meet at a point. So geometrically, the, those infrared land effects, like gamma zeta, Will correspond to certain loops p tilde upstairs in the in the covering um, in the spectral cover. So, um, like the, the the most sorry the, the 
the simplest choice would be suppose you already have a loop downstairs on C, you just lift it to some some certain given sheet of this covering that will give you a loop. But a lot of times that will happen that you will give um, there are some detour rules that will allow you to patch together some some um, some close paths on C Kilda. And I will not describe those those um, rules uh, in detail here. And those rules will work out um, in the math language by Falk Gunchov and also in the physics language by Jiemen. And, and also uh, the, the gamma here, which is the electromagnetic charges that I was talking about, is identified with the homology class of the uh, corresponding loops. OK, so as I mentioned earlier, so the, the vibe of this infrared land effects should, be, um, should not be some globally well-defined homomorphic function. And indeed, that's, uh, that's the case. So upon circle compactification, the web of the infrared land effects wrapping the circle with radius uh, R are local double coordinates on this uh, modular space of light GC connections. And depending on the choice of your parameter, uh, by that I mean theta or phase out theta, and also where you are on the Coulomb branch, and also, of course, the what, what's the GC group here? What you could get are you, you could produce Falk Gunchov or complexified Fenchel Nielsen if you're looking at, uh, say, SL2 case, or in the higher rank case, say, SL3 or, or higher SLN, you will get, um, um, if you tune the parameters correctly, you could get higher rank Falk Gunchov coordinates or the higher length twist coordinates generalizing complexified Fenchel Nielsen, or in general, you could get some exotic spectral coordinates. Uh, on the modular space of black connections. So uh, the, the, these coordinates have been studied in, in both physics and math literatures, where I, I choose a, a sample of the references here. But um, uh, I should make a comment about the references. So uh, it, it could happen that, and I think I'm almost 100% sure that I'm missing references here. If you think I made some reference, please uh, either tell me on the spot, or if you found it later, you could email me that I, I could make improvement. And, but I want to mention like a, a, a difference, like, like a subtlety about the, the coordinates you get from this land effects here, from the coordinates, for example, in um, Bridgeland's talk and I believe in Coleman's talk on Friday. Um, so sometimes when people talk about those coordinates, um, the, it, it's not directly the vibe of the infrared land effects, but, uh, uh, but, but the, the image after the Sorry, but the coordinates for the modular space after you take the so-called conformal limit, which I will mention near the end of my talk. Um, and there's also, um, yeah, that's the one subtlety I'll mention here. So there's some nice properties of those coordinates. For example, uh, you could define the holomorphic Poisson brackets, um, which is uh, given as follow. And this, um, this pairing between gamma and gamma prime in the physics language are the DSZ pairing, uh, for the infrared charge lattice. And in the mathematical language, as we uh, said, that this gamma is identified with some integer uh, first, first homology class of C tilde, then this pairing in that language is identified with the intersection pairing. And also those spectral coordinates has very, or sorry, when I say spectral coordinates, I meant those double coordinates, chi gamma. This chi gamma has nice asymptotic behaviors as zeta goes to zero and zeta goes to infinity. And it has discontinuities across um, the so-called BPS rays, which are rays um, in the zeta plane, which are controlled by the concierge Silverman symplectomorphisms. And uh, those, those properties uh, made it possible that chi gamma are solutions to a certain Riemann-Hilbert problem, which I will describe a little bit near the end of my talk. Uh, okay, so, so are there any questions at this point? All right, so, so uh, what we have said so far are um, we have the UV land effects and this web gives you JZ holomorphic trace functions on the modular space of red GC connections on, on the Riemann surface C. And we also have the web of the infrared land effects which are double coordinates on the on this uh, flat connection, sorry, on the modular space of flat GC connections. And then what does this tells you is that the physical language of the UVIR map could imply this uh, following map, which I call it the trace map because um, the, the quantum version of it is denoted as quantum trace map. 
Um, so anyway, so on the left hand side, you have to trace all the flight GC connection along some path, uh, along some um, close non self intersecting curve on C in the representation R. On the right hand side, you're expanding this trace in terms of double coordinates with integer coefficients. Um, so alternatively, a different way that we, we view those double coordinates is as holonomies of a different flight connection, which is uh, strictly speaking, it's an almost flat connections, but let, uh, let's not deal with that subtlety there. Um, so it, it, it could be written as holonomies of, um, of, of uh, abelian flat connection along this uh, cycle gamma here um, on the spectral curve, say tilde. So if you interpret it that way, this UVR map here could be interpreted as a non-abelianization map. Namely, you're expressing the trace of holonomy of some flat non-abelian connection in terms of trace of holonomy of a flat, uh, almost flat abelian connection. And uh, this, is, uh, th this point of view will also play a role uh, in the exact WKB analysis, which I will mention near the end of my talk. So um, we, we described this, so far we described this UVR map as a trace map. And um, one natural question one could ask is whether there's a Q deformation for this trace map or this UVR map. So uh, to, to motivate that, let me tell you another ingredients on the physics side, namely uh, the land effects operator products. So we, we said that land effects, the web of land effects gives you JZ holomorphic functions. And there's a natural algebra structure on the space of JZ holomorphic functions. And physical interpretation are going to be the land effects operator products where um, remember the land effects are extending along time direction. So they're sitting at a point in the three dimensional space. So you could consider and bring two land effects together. In a generic physical theory, such operator products will be singular. However, here, because you have supersymmetry, if the two land effects you're considering preserve the same supersymmetry, then the, uh, the translation between the insertion point in the 3D uh, space will be Q exact, where Q is the supercharge um, preserved by the land effects. So in that way, when you bring those two together, the limit will be non-singular and give you a third land effects, which is a product land effects. And I denote it as simply as um, writing it as L1 zeta, L2 zeta. And then if you take the if you look at the web of this product land effect, it is a product of the web of the individual land effect. So this gives a, so this physical operation corresponds to the uh, the mathematical algebra structure on the space of JZ holomorphic functions. And this algebra structure admits a quantization where the so-called skin algebra sorry skin algebras, and there are various different ways to understand uh, how skin algebras appear here. Now describe like one uh, example skin algebra in the next slides. But uh, for example, um, on this, um, if, you, if you view land effects correspond to these holomorphic functions, there's a, a certain uh, Poisson bracket you could find there, which you could then use to quantize to get some non-commutative algebra. And uh, also in the physics language, you could also understand the appearance of skin algebras from the AGT point of view. But the, uh, the, the earliest consideration of the skin algebra probably happens in the chunk salmon series. And uh, more concretely, it should be, um, so there's some relation between the setup I talk about and the analytically continued chern salmon series on the Riemann surface C cross R, uh, which I will not go into details. But from there, you would also expect this uh, skin algebra appearing as a quantization of the land effects OP. Uh, however, I will mention here uh, uh, yet another physical point of view of this quantization. Namely, one could consider turn, to turn on omega deformation on a spatial R2 plane. After that, the supersymmetric land effects are required to sit uh, along a fixed axis in R3, which I denote as RH direction. And then as you bring together, say, these two land effects together, uh, you, you will get some product I would denote it as star. However, the two different directions, whether you bring L1 from, you know, from the left of L2 or bring it from the right of L2 will be different. So what you get is some non-commutative associated OPE. Um, okay, so, so the land effects OPE will be quantized to some non-commutative um, 
algebra. In the UV, it's um, in general complicated. It's de described by some skin algebra. In the infrared, however, it's easier to describe such a uh, non-commutative OPE. It's simply given by the quantum torus algebra, which uh, I, I wrote here. So on the left-hand side, you have a land effects uh, with infrared charge gamma one and, uh, and uh, land effects uh, with infrared charge gamma two, and you consider their OPE. And then on the right-hand side, you get the, the land effects with uh, infrared charge gamma one plus gamma two, which is expected because uh, the infrared charge should, uh, should uh, add together when you bring those two land effects together. However, the non-commutativity part will be taken care of by this uh, actual factor where Q is a deformation parameter or the exponential of the, um, the, the omega background parameter in the Microsoft such limit, such really limit, sorry. And then the pairing in the exponential here is the DSA pairing, as I said earlier, it's identified with intersection pairing in the first homology of C tilde. So uh, let me comment that physically there's a nice interpretation of this OPE, namely, uh, if you look at, uh, think of those land effects as uh, word lines of infinitely massive ions with charge gamma one, gamma two, when, when you bring them together, this actual contribution um, take care of the angular momentum for the electromagnetic fields uh, sourced by the, the dions gamma one, gamma two on the left-hand side, which will not be there if you don't add, that, um, add this contribution because on the right-hand side, you will have a single dion with um, charge gamma one plus gamma two. And one could do a simple rewriting of this quantum torus algebra uh, which gives you this non-commutative uh, operator product. And this, in a sense, uh, quantizes the Poisson algebra, the coordinate functions, which it, uh, I showed you a couple pages earlier. So, so we said that in the UV, you get some complicated skin algebra. In the infrared, you get quantum torus. So this hints that you should have a quantum trace map, which embed the UV skin algebra into a quantum torus algebra. And I will talk about an example which is uh, I'll, I'll take my, my Lie algebra to be GL2 here. And then the space of land effects in the UV equipped with this non-commutative OPE is described by the so-called GL2 home free skin algebra of the three manifold M, which is C cross this RH direction. And it's defined as the space of formal linear combinations of frame oriented links up to isotopy, where the coefficients are some long polynomials in Q modulo the following skin relations. And I apologize that this figure is actually for GLN hopefully, so please substitute n equals two in the figure. So how do you understand those skin relations? So uh, those are sort of like the local operations you do on links. So here, this dotted line uh, is the projection of the S3 sphere to, the, um, to your computer screen. And what you do is you keep everything outside of this S3 sphere fixed, but only do um, modify the link configurations locally inside the S3 sphere according to what's shown here. For example, the first relation says that um, the configuration where, where you have an overcrossing uh, differs from the configuration where you have an undercrossing by a configuration where the crossing is resolved uh, at the cost of the actual factor of Q minus Q inverse. And the second relation could be understood as a change of framing relation. And third relation simply said, okay, in the n equals two case, you could delete this, this little loop which, uh, which is sitting inside a, a three ball. And then the algebra structure here is defined by stacking links along the RH direction. So, so uh, you, you recall that, um, the, um, sorry, um, by that I meant um, you, you uh, suppose you have two links where um, sitting along this RH direction and then you bring them together and the, the order is described by, for example, um, the, the, the links on the, on the, um, for the uh, appearing on the left hand side of the star operation um, have a, a smaller RH coordinate and the link appearing on the right hand side of the star operation have a higher coordinate and you bring them together um, and then you resolve all the crossings according to these relations and then the, whatever you get are going to be the product of those two links. So in the infrared you could describe a skin algebra a very, in a very similar manner. So those are going to correspond to frame-oriented links in a different covering three manifold, which is a, 
a spectral curve across the real line RH direction. And then um, compared with the UV scan algebra, you see that the skin relations are comparably sim simpler. In particular, here you could direct, directly resolve a crossing here, either at a cost of Q or at a cost of Q inverse. And there is um, a little subtlety which appears here. It's because recall that the spectral curve C tilde is a branch covering over C. So uh, there will be branch points. And those at branch points will induce a one dimensional branching locus for the M tilde, whose projection is denoted by the or by an orange cross here. So the third rule is a little subtle, which involves the sun. Namely, if you put a link strand across this branch point, you will get a negative sun here. And I told you a couple slides earlier that infrared skin algebra, sorry, the infrared um, land effects OPE is described by the quantum towers. And here I gave you a completely different definition of the infrared skin algebra. And it's not difficult to prove that this uh, skin algebra is actually isomorphic to the quantum towers. So, okay, so we introduced the, the quantization of the algebra loops uh, on the UV and the IR side in terms of skin algebras. And now um, one would expect a quantum trace map, which I denote F here, which is a homomorphism from the UV skin algebra to the infrared quantum torus algebra. And physically, it represents a Q-deformed UV IR map. Namely, still on the left-hand side, you have a UV line defects. And on the right-hand side, sorry, on the right-hand side, you have this expansion in terms of infrared land defects. However, now the coefficients are not going to be integers anymore. Uh, generically, there are some long polynomials in Q. And physically, um, you could still understand it as some sort of frame BPS index, but uh, refined, which counts the uh, supersymmetric ground states in the back defect system, uh, refined with their spin info uh, in the super selection sector in the infrared labeled by the infrared charge gun. And uh, this index, which will also go through frame wall crossing um, where uh, the corresponding operation will be conjugation by, by the corresponding quantum dialogarism of the, um, depending on the BPS data associated with the wall. So one, uh, I should say that this quantum trace map has been studied in many, many different contexts of both in physics and mathematics. And one particular feature that I think is um, I personally think it's interesting is the connection with link invariant. So namely, the simplest case is, is if you take M is equal to R3 or take your Riemann, sur sorry, take your Riemann surface to be like non-compact R2. In this case, this quantum trace map actually computes a familiar link invariant, which is this particular one parameter limit of the home flip polynomial. And where this uh, W here is a self-linking number of the link and then um, a and Z are specified as Q to the N and Q minus Q inverse respected. And this hopefully polynomial could be thought of as a higher order, higher rank generalization of Jones polynomial. And moreover, it also works, namely if you, uh, in the following case, namely if you take M equals to the Riemann surface cross R and then take L contained, contained in a three ball inside M, and in that case, this quantum trace map will still gives you the, this one parameter limit of Homfley polynomial. And um, mathematically, I think uh, it's been proven, for example, in the N equals two case by Bonohan Wang. And then there's some generalization by uh, Douglas and Sun uh, for, for, for N equals three case. And uh, physically, I have studied such a uh, quantum trace map and the relation to link invariant with uh, Andy Nesky. And we have some algorithm to which, which um, actually are completely different from, from Bonahan Wan and Douglas Sun to, to, to produce such a result. Uh, okay, let me show you an example. So, so let's take uh, the Lie algebra G to be SL2 and take the Riemann surface C to be a four puncture sphere. And I draw a figure here where, oh, um, sorry, let me say um, the, 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 the spectral curve or the separate return curve say tilde is taken to be uh, this, where the quadratic differential is explicitly specified here. So on the figure, I draw the projection of say tilde onto this four puncture sphere, where the blue dots are punctures and the orange crosses are branch points. And uh, you can ignore um, those, those black lines. So that's like one of the 
I'm ignoring like some really important ingredient in this construction of the quantum trace map, uh, which uh, under which one could call different people will call a different names, spectral networks or Stokes curves and so on. And I will not describe details there. And then the corresponding paths uh, I will consider here is just this little loop uh, going around this blue puncture here and also this blue puncture here. And running the algorithm, what you get um, is, is this uh, formal expansion in terms of X gamma, where you see that um, most of the coefficients are just one, so they have trivial spin. However, you also have, <coughs> sorry, however, you also have those, um, uh, those non-trivial spin contributions, which uh, actually form characters of the SU2 representation. So this is related to um, some, some conjecture in, I think, proven by, by, by uh, in some contexts in mathematics, um, by the name positivity conjecture or no exotics conjecture in physics. Um, but anyway, so you see that the, the coefficients um, could be refined to be characters of SU2. Um, okay, so in the last 10 minutes, I plan to say something about exact WKB, but before that, are there any questions regarding the quantum trace map? Okay, so, so- Hey, hey I have a question. Yeah. I see some minus signs there. What about the yeah. positivity? Yeah, yeah, so, so it's related to my convention for, for this um, frame protected spin character. So I'm- I see, so that's, this is not, not a contradiction with the- no, 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 so that's a great point. So the, the no exotics conjecture means that uh, those states carry I3 equals to zero. So they are singlet on their SU2R. So what you will get is like a character expansion in terms of minus Q instead of Q. Uh, so only for half integer representations. Which okay. ones. Okay. Yes, so, so uh, it's because it's odd. Um, I think your convention like and some other people convention is like it's Q to the 2J3 something, um, but, but it's, it's the same positivity conjecture. Um, yeah. Thank you, yeah, good. Uh, okay, so so in the last eight minutes, I will I will just look at the web of this infrared line defects. Um, as we briefly mentioned earlier, the webs of infrared line defects have some distinguished analytic properties, where uh, Tom Richland also mentioned and Evan Smith also mentioned in their talks. Um, so so um, to summarize, um, the the first distinguished analytic property is asymptotics. So namely. If you take, sorry, if you take this uh, this C star parameter zeta goes to zero along certain ray in the C star plane, then uh, this chi gamma zeta, um, so the, the leading asymptotic contribution of the chi gamma zeta is determined as follows. In particular, it's written as exponential of R, which is a compactification radius of this extra circle, uh, divided by zeta times Z gamma, where Z gamma is a period integral of the several written differential lambda, uh, which is uh, in physics language called central charge or in the WKB language called classical period. So that's the asymptotics property. And um, there's also a jumping property. For example, if you consider a ray, uh, which denotes as L here sitting inside the C star plane, the Z C star zeta plane with a phase theta zero, then you could consider this, um, this spectral coordinates chi gamma zeta at the limit where um, the argument of zeta approach theta from different directions. And those two limits will differ by a factor which I denote as SL here, which also appeared in uh, Tom Richland's talk. And it consists of cons conservative solvable mass simplectic morphisms determined by the DT invariance omega gamma. So I, I didn't write down the explicit formula here, but it's very similar to um, what um, Richland has described in his talk. And there's an actual um, property which didn't appear uh, in, in, the, in the coordinates that Richland talked about, uh, which is reality coordinates. Namely, it takes a conjugate of chi gamma zeta, it's going to be equal to uh, the, uh, the, sorry, the spectral coordinates carrying the charge minus gamma at minus one divided by zeta bar. So this reality condition relates the limit of zeta goes to zero with the limit of zeta goes to infinity. And the reason you don't see it um, in, in other talks is because in the conformal, it's because of conformal limit, which I will describe um, momentarily. But before that, 
let me say a few words about the Riemann Hilbert problem. So this chi gamma zeta here, they are conjectured to solve a Riemann Hilbert problem in the zeta plane, which was formulated by GMN. And moreover, the solutions are given by certain TBA-like integral equations. And uh, this Riemann Hilbert problem is related to the Riemann Hilbert problem considered by Bridgeland, where the so-called conformal limit are uh, Galton. Um, so let me mention, uh, I will not describe this um, Riemann Hilbert problem in detail. However, let me mention that there's this very interesting paper by Barbieri, Rachel, and Stoppa, where they formulated a quantized Riemann Hilbert problem and moreover constructed solutions in certain example. So there could be a, a meaningful question, which is could we understand or, or generalize their construction <clears throat> to, to more examples uh, from physics point of view? And based on some discussions with GMN, uh, we think that uh, one could possibly achieve such a thing uh, by, by exactly looking at, at the infrared line operators on X gamma, which, whose web gives you the chi gamma here. And then by turning on this half omega deformation along this special R2 plane, where their OPE will become non-cumulative. Uh, so it would be very interesting to understand such a uh, construction from a physics point of view. Okay, so now um, in the last four minutes, I will mention conformal limit and connection to the exact WKB methods for OPERS. So recall that the Hitchin system, when, when I showed you the Hitchin equations like uh, long ago, uh, at the beginning of my, of my talk, it has a parameter uh, R there, which is the radius of the co compactification circle. And the conformal limit is given as follows. You take R goes to zero, zeta goes to zero, However, you fix the ratio between zeta and r, which um, is the h bar parameter here. And then under this conformal limit, the Hitchin section, which I didn't define, but um, you, you um, sorry, I, I think I've not going to define the Hitchin section. However, the Hitchin section in the Hitchin module space side will become the varieties of Oper's uh, LH bar here. And this, this was conjectured by Gaiotto, um, and it was proven for the case of SLN Oper's by these people. And I, I'm not sure about the current status like in the math side for, for like whether, like how much more proof people have done. So, so I'm sorry if I, I missed some, um, some of your work. Um, so what are the opers? So as an example, if you take GC as SL2C, then the family of opers is determined by a quadratic differential phi two on C, which was also um, described in Ivan Smith's talk earlier this week. And locally, so OPER is some global object, but locally you could write it as this, this sort of Schrodinger operator where P2Z is determined by this quadratic differential. So it's like the local form of how you write the quadratic differential. And um, so being, being the, the Schrodinger operators uh, hints that the spectral coordinates that, sorry, um, I should say that um, we, so far we have dis been describing the spectral coordinate before the conformal limit, which um, they have the physical interpretation of the webs or infrared line defects. After the conformal limit, they will become uh, the so-called uh, chi gamma H bar, which uh, will also be double coordinates on uh, different modular space of flag connections, which is the modular space of flag connections you get after you take the conformal limit. So those turns out to be very important tools in the exact WKB analysis for OPERS due to um, some geometric reformulation of the exact WKB, um, where this uh, so-called abelianization language, uh, worked out by German, uh, Holandsky, uh, Holandsky, Allegretti, Nikolev, and others. Um, there's been some uh, recent developments, and I think I'm not keeping track of all the uh, mass developments there, um, but that's the, the, the big picture. So uh, concretely, um, I will I will just describe. There, there are many interesting relations which I will not say, but let me just say some 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 um, immediately relation uh, in the last slides here. So concretely, this this double coordinates are related to the so-called world symbols in the language of exact WKB, and they play an important role in the computation of pe quantum periods. So recall that uh, the WKB unlocks for the Schrodinger equation where the Schrodinger operator is just given as this, uh, is you take the wave function or the solution to the Schrodinger equation as exponential one over h bar integral of this uh, lambda here, where z0 is some base point you choose. And for this 
psi z or the wave function to satisfy the Schrodinger equation, lambda will satisfy, oops. Uh, okay, sorry. Lambda will satisfy the, the, the corresponding Riccati equation, which is shown on the slide. And um, the first step to construct a WKB solution is one could try to construct a formal power series expansion of lambda in H bar, which solves this Riccati equation. So, so I, I um, so I wrote it there. So namely, you could um, just make a formal on that of lambda, um, which uh, will, sorry, maybe let me say it this way. So you make a formal on that of lambda, which uh, is given as a power series expansion in H bar, in particular at the order H bar to the zero. So the first leading order, the Riccati equation will become the separating curve or the spectral curve. So which is the branch cover over the Riemann surface C you're considering. So once you pick a sheet, of this branch covering, or which denoted by i here, or once you pick a solution to the uh, first, you know, order h plus zero equation, all the higher order solutions are determined by perturbatively so solving the Riccati equation. Those are determined uh, de denoted as lambda i n here, and because the order zero solution corresponds to the several written differential. Where, whose integral along some cycles on the several written curve will give you the classical periods. So one could imagine to define the so-called quantum periods by just taking the integral of this formal uh, power series expansion in H bar along gamma. And as Marcos uh, described um, yesterday, that um, if you, so for the, for the Schrodinger equation case, um, there will, the, 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 there, you, you will all only get contributions from the say H bar to the even power, however, the coefficients in this um, expansion of pi gamma here will diverge factorially. So I need to properly resum it. And the natural way to resum those quantum periods is to borrow resummation, where um, we also had like two, heard two great talks um, yesterday and the day before yesterday. And moreover, uh, a very interesting observation is that the resurgent properties of quantum periods are controlled by the 40 BPS spectrum and based on uh, many recent works um, which, which explored these kind of relations in various different examples. So what is the relation of the spectral coordinates here to the quantum periods? So the conjecture picture is um, the VAR symbol here is supposed to produce to you the Borari sum quantum periods. And I should say that, um, of course, the pi gamma h bar, but depending on where you are in the h bar plane, it could not, it could be that it's not for resumable, in which case um, these spectral coordinates will be conjectured to produce a so-called median bar resummation. So I I uh, from my understanding, like I don't I don't know the like the mathematical proof. Um, so from my um it, like um memory that the, the original proof probably goes by uh, these two guys, but it uh, was also revisited uh, later by, by, by other people. Uh, but I, as I said, I'm not sure about the status of the mathematical proof here. So, so please correct me if you think uh, there are some other references or, or the story is different. Um, but one thing I think I'm certain is um, this, 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 this conjecture is proven for, for the Schrodinger equation case or the order two or SL2 OPER case for higher order OPERs where by higher order OPER, I just mean you will have the higher order derivatives um, instead of like dz squared, you'll have dz cubed or even higher. In that case, uh, this remains to be a conjecture. However, um, there have been some numerical uh, analysis is done in various different examples. So in the, in, the, in the last negative four minutes, sorry, let me just mention one last point which didn't fit into the slides, namely the OPER manifold um, I didn't describe it, but but since since it's the image of the Higgins action after the conformal limit, it's um, it is like isomorphic to the Coulomb branch or the Higgins base, but not in a canonical way. However, one thing you do know is that the upper manifold is half dimensional sitting inside the Higgins modular space. Since it's half dimensional, if you're considering your spectral coordinates restricted to the upper manifold, there will obey some relations which are described by the so-called generating function of OPERs. So um, there is this nice conjecture by um, conjecture and proven later for some cases by Nekrasov, Rosley, and Shatashvili, which says that um, there exists a very nice double coordinate system 
uh, under which the OPER generating function is identified with certain uh, effective twisted spur potential for uh, a 2D 2,2 surface defect up to some boundary corrections at infinity. So this NRS conjecture um, or the corresponding NRS coordinates are identified with particular kind of spectral coordinates. In the shooting the operator case, they are identified with the complexified finchel nielsen coordinates. And for higher order opers, uh, it's conjectured that, and it's worked out in physics by um, in some physical examples that such um, NRS coordinates will correspond to the higher rank generalization of finchel nielsen which uh, one usually denoted as higher length twist coordinates. Um, okay, so that, that concludes my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you very much, Faye. It's a nice talk. Um, um, does anyone have any questions or comments? I have a question to the beginning of your talk. Yeah. Actually, it's rather a question about the dictionary. No, no, I mean, you don't, you don't have to go. Uh, you, you mentioned that this R, R goes to zero limit gives uh -huh. uh, 3D and equal four. And you basically consider uh, this Gyota Murinetsky, which corresponds to large radius. Uh, is there any re relation between this algebra of line um, the facts which you mentioned, which is sort of very clear and very simple, and something which is more complicated in in the other limit in three D and equal four. Yes, so I I'm, I'm, I don't have a good understanding of this Argos zero limit, other than it's described by some quiver series, some quiver three D equals it's described by some three D equals for quiver series, but I. I suppose you were asking like, what's the geometric correspondence for um, this land effects star right there? Um, yeah, I mean, there in 3D and equal four, there is this complicated mathematical construction by Braverman, Finkelberg and Nakajima, which seems to agree with physics. And this, it, it looks completely different Yes. Different structures from what you see, what I saw here. Is it just two completely different stories and there is no relation? Or, there there could be a relation, but, but I, I'm afraid I not, I don't, I think there might be some relation, but I don't know. But I mean, the line, line operator in that limit will correspond to some local operators in the 3D equals 4 theory. But, um, but I'm not sure. Um, so there, there, there's a different description of land effects, which I didn't talk about at all, uh, which is you could also describe it in terms of some, um, some quiver quantum mechanics or framed quiver quantum mechanics. And I wonder that whether one could, and I wonder whether that kind of description has a natural, uh, limit like in, in the Argos to zero limit that you, you talked about, but um, <clears throat> I don't know. Is there I a potential know. in that quiver quantum mechanics or, or just a quiver? So sorry, say it again. Uh, is it a quiver or quiver with a potential? Is this a quiver or? I mean, okay, is, is it just a quiver or there is also um, kind of Polynomial and arrows of that quiver. Oh, oh yes, there, there, you, you mean the super potential for the quiver? Yeah, super yes, potential. Yes, there is. Yeah, but, but, yeah but, uh, okay, but, uh, it's interesting. No, but, but I, I'm, I'm sorry to say that I could be completely wrong that those two pictures are not related at all. I'm just saying that, like in, in the 40 equals two case, you, you could describe land effects in terms of frame quivers, but I don't know whether that actually mapped to anything in the 3D equals four theory when you take R goes to zero limit. Hmm. Okay, and, and another gen general question. Greg mentioned that this line operators should form kind of a monoidal category, which means that this story, which you mentioned, it admits kind of mathematical categorification. Yes. Well, like algebra will uh, be replaced by a monoidal category, and this UV to 
uh, uh, IR in e e ultraviolet and infrared uh, think they should be the relation from probably, I don't know, like if I imagine that this um, Darbu charts should correspond to some objects, maybe simple objects of that monoidal category. What physicists know about this categorification? So, um, so I, I'm not a category five person, so um, I, I don't, no, Greg know, but, but I, I think there's some recent work mm -hmm. by David Jordan and others. Um, um, mathematical work, yeah, okay. Yes, um, so somehow, um, I, I think somehow there's a, there's an approach where you're, you're considering some GL twisted includes four super young males, um, where I think which is what Jordan and collaborators are considering, and maybe it is related to the story I, I described earlier, or maybe it's different. But I, I'm not. Um, I, I don't really know much about categorification. So yeah, basically, um, maybe... just ma mathematical part, and physicists somehow understand it, but do not tell to to, to others. Uh, maybe Greg uh, knows the current yeah, status but... of. Categorification, but I, 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 would, I would expect there's a categorical analog for sure, but um, I don't know of any careful work that's been published on that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, it, in, so when you were introducing these line defects, uh -huh. you originally said that there was, um, you know, they depended on like a choice of path and a choice of representation of the uh, gauge group Lie algebra. Uh -huh. Can you can you say again why why that dependence disappears or whether it disappears when you go to a point on the Coulomb branch? Oh, you mean like why does, for example, why it only depends on the homotopy class or the path or? Well, okay. No, so, the dependence never disappears. Maybe it dis disappeared in my notation. I'm sorry. So uh, okay. this, this dependence never disappeared. It did. It disappeared because I didn't write this path and the representation later because the expressions got ugly. Hmm. Uh, oh, wait a minute. So uh, wait. Maybe I didn't understand your question. So okay, in the slide called like I think I slide fourteen. Oh, um, I don't know which page is. Oh, I see. Oh, yeah, um, I see the page. Okay. It's the title is like the UVIR map for line defects. Yeah, yeah. There we go. So like, I where so on the left hand side there's like a line defect which presumably has a hidden dependence on. Yeah, it, it does. Um, sorry, it, it does. Where does that dependence appear on the right hand side? Ah, it, it uh, so this this um this it, it appears as a whole on the on the right hand side. So there is this um. I didn't mention how you actually do this, but but um, the geometric way you do it is through some path lifting rule, where on the left hand side you have some paths on the Riemann surface C, and then on the right hand side, as I said earlier, this infrared line defects correspond to lifted paths on the separating curve or spectral curve. So there is a question of how do you lift some paths P or let's say some some loop P downstairs to upstairs, and those um, and the results of this lifting will depend on like which path you started with, um, but it's implicit um, because I didn't describe to you the the procedure. The procedure. Um, this kind of path lifting rule was described by GMN in the language of spectral networks, and I believe okay. that in the A1 case, uh, it was also described by uh, Falk Gontrov. Uh, in the name of millipedes, like because it has many legs, you could um, use the detours, but I, I didn't describe in detail. And then there's also corresponding Q version of this kind of path lifting rules, uh, which are also worked out by, later by, by other people. I see, sorry. So I'm used to, I'm used to thinking of like the BPS indices from GMN, which just depend on, like just depend on the Coulomb branch point, I think. Um, like, uh, but, but, but the dependence on the pass is here, like the line L set out here. Right. I guess what I'm asking is, is are those are those sort of BPS indices different from these framed BPS indices? 
the string be passing? Oh, the frames? No, these are not. They're, uh, okay, they're the same. Oh, sorry, I'll look at GMN again. Thank you. Yeah, no, no. Uh, uh, the the Q version is sometimes called frame protected spin character, which I didn't okay. describe in detail. But uh, the Q goes to one limit, give you the integers, which is, um, I call it frame BPS index, but different people call it different names. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I see that Pietro has his hand up. Pietro? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Hi, uh, hi, Faith. Thanks for the really nice talk. Uh, just a quick question. So, regarding your work uh, on the relation to uh, not invariance, I was wondering in the same vein whether um, you, uh, so, so I guess you computed these things for. Uh, rank n in the fundamental representation? Yeah. I mean, the Humphrey PT uh, in the fundamental representation, but do, could you also do it for any other representations? Like including um, especially, not just the symmetric ones, but also uh, generic? Um, yeah, so, so that's a great question. So that's like a, a, like a generalization of our construction, um, which I, I believe it's doable, but I haven't uh, started doing that. Um, so, I, so, so first of all, um, sorry, where is it? So this, this skin algebra, so, so our construction, which was considering like a simplified skin algebra, which um, does not describe the whole, you know, the OPE of a whole set of land defects in say GLN theories, which as you said, we were just labeling you know, the strands with just fundamental representation. And then in particular, we didn't include the junction rules and stuff. But there, there has been uh, works by, um, for example, Gabella, Coleman, Gabella, Teschner, where they, they did consider some of these uh, junction rules. Uh, so the, um, our construction, uh, is, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, it depends on this uh, foliation structure instead of um, sorry, this exfoliation structure, which I didn't describe, and there are lots of subtle, subtleties to assign, you know, the local factors or like whether you assign Q or Q square or Q inverse, uh, even in this case. So, so I suppose it's doable uh, for these general, general representations. However, uh, it, it might be a little more difficult, um, but uh, maybe one sentence is I haven't started doing that, but I think it's a great generalization. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, I think we've um, come to the end of the session. So um, let's thank Faye again for this uh, very nice talk. Thank you very much. And um, we will resume with a discussion 